Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome to episode 51 of the Alex Walt Show. I'm your host, Alex Walt, alongside another very special guest. And today, we're talking about the Charlotte Hornets. The Hornets' regular season begins Wednesday. And joining me to preview all things Charlotte Hornets and more is Rob Longo, the studio host for the Hornets. Rob, welcome back, man. I appreciate you joining me. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Appreciate you having me on once again. So the big star in Charlotte, LaMelo Ball. We talk about him all the time here. On the Alec Walt Show, he was one of the best rookies, if not the best rookie in the NBA before the injury last season, and he has the chance to grow his game even further. Give me your early impressions here so far in camp and in the preseason of the star guard here for the Hornets. Yeah, so that's obviously big. the big question this year is, is LaMelo Ball going to be LaMelo Ball of last year before he hurt that wrist? And yeah, I mean, I, I think he is. Everything indicates that for the most part based on what we've seen in camp what we've seen in some preseason games I mean I think it was the third preseason game I want to say against Miami 22 minutes in of of playing time going into the fourth quarter I think he had 18 9 and 8 or something like that I mean he was on the cusp of a triple double in a preseason game so I think it's kind of safe to say that Melo is back even if he was never gone to begin with. So, you know, it's just going to be a matter of him gelling with some new pieces, which shouldn't really be much of a problem. I mean, the only big piece that is different from last year's team is Mason Plumlee joining the fold at the number five spot who was acquired from the Pistons in a trade on draft night this offseason. So other than that, it's kind of the same starting five that he had last year. Hopefully, you know, I'm pounding the wood <laughs> here if Gordon Hayward stays healthy because yeah. I mean, he was kind of the straw that stirred the drink last year. I mean, he was he was the floor for the Hornets. That's something that Sam Farber, our play-by-play broadcaster, and I talk about all the time on our Hornets Hivecast on our podcast is, you know, Gordon Hayward is the floor for this team. He is, you know, the base model. If he is able to go out there and play all the time, then, you know, the Hornets are going to do well. And we saw that last year. Hornets were four games above 500 before he got hurt. And just, of course, once again, was another kind of freak accident and freak injury for Gordon, unfortunately. But, you know, and then, like we said, he's the floor. The floor just bottomed out, it seemed like. I mean, but LaMelo Ball, of course, is the ceiling for this team. You know, the more playmaking abilities that he has, the better off this team's going to be. We've asked him a couple times throughout camp and everything, you know, is the game starting to slow down for you? What's the next step? And Lamelo says that the game is starting to slow down, and we ask James Borrego, the head coach, all the time, what does Lamelo do, need to do this year? And he said that he needs to become more of a game manager, and I think we've seen a lot of younger players take that step the last couple of seasons. You've seen guys like Luka Doncic in Dallas. You've seen Trey Young do it in Atlanta, especially last year in the playoffs. I mean, Trey Young really took a big step last year. Oh, yeah. So a lot of people are hoping that Lamelo Ball is going to take that extra leap in his sophomore season. So what are your expectations for LaMelo this season? Do you expect him to take that? I would, I mean, there's no question. I think yeah. that's the expectation overall. And I think that's the, that's kind of the goal. I mean, that's the expectation is like I said, I mean, if you're in a preseason game and you've only played 20 some minutes and you're close to a triple double, I mean, that was against the Miami heat too. And the, and the heat played most of their big stars for the most part. So, I mean, you know, it's just a good thing to see that, he's able to go out and put that kind of numbers up after an off season where there were some question marks just in terms of, you know, his health and the personnel that was going to be coming back for the Hornets. So, you know, I don't see there's any reason for LaMelo to take a step back. I know a lot of people talk about sophomore slumps and that sort of thing and sports just in general, but you know, the way that LaMelo is starting to grow into his body a little bit more, he did put on some muscle in the off season. Nice. There's no reason for him to take that extra step. So let's look at some of the other players here on this team. Obviously, you talked about LaMelo and Hayward already. I want to talk about the guy who's sandwiched in between them in the starting five, and that's Terry Rozier. Give me your thoughts on the fact that he's still around and how these two have gelled together in the backcourt. Well, Terry, of course, is kind of the cornerstone of the team now, and that's been made apparent. I mean, he had a career year last year shooting. They gave him a contract extension. He loves Charlotte. He loves playing here. He doesn't want to leave her. Well, he wouldn't be signing that extension, of course. So, you know, the fact that, they decided to go with Terry Rozier. I don't think that's a bad decision at all, obviously. I mean, it was a loaded backcourt, like you mentioned last year, with guys like Malik Monk and like Devontae Graham. And they just kind of, I don't want to say wore out their welcome in Charlotte, but it was just kind of apparent that the way that this team is set up right now with LaMelo Ball, he's obviously your future. I mean, keep in mind last year that LaMelo didn't even start as as a rookie last year. I mean, he came off the bench 
for the first handful of games. And then Devontae Graham goes down with an injury. And then it was LaMelo Ball's job the rest of the way out. It's not the fact that Devontae got beat out or anything like that. It's just, you know, he had an injury similar to, you know, I'm not going to compare LaMelo Ball to Tom Brady, but, you know, Tom Brady had to get his opportunity because of an injury. And, you know, he was kind of, you know, history wrote itself after that. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing for LaMelo Ball. And Devontae's obviously moved on to, I don't want to say bigger and better things in New Orleans, but I mean, you know, he's in a starting role. That's what he wanted. And Malik Monk, I think he wanted to stick around, but it was just not enough room at the end for another point guard of, of his caliber. So, I mean, you know, he's going to be with the Lakers this year and we'll see what happens with that. But, you know, with the way that the backcourt shook out with a guy like Terrier's year, it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, the guy's a gamer. He only missed three games last year due to a bum knee a couple of times. He's been nursing an ankle injury here in camp the last couple of weeks, but you know, his motto is, and this is what he said yesterday in his pregame availability, his availability to the media was if it's not broken, I'm playing, you know, he said that the man upstairs is going to take care of him and he fully believes that. So, you know, Terry is, I call him Youngstown tough. He's from Youngstown, Ohio. It's a typical, you know, um, steel town, former steel town, Rust Belt, as as Rust Belt as it gets. Um, you know, I call him Youngstown tough. And that's kind of what the motto is there. And that's the nature of where he grew up. And it shows in his game. I mean, he'll he's not afraid to go after and attack the rim or anything like that. He'll get after it. So, you know, he's really complimentary of a guy like LaMelo Ball. I think Terry plays a lot better off the ball. We saw him at point guard a little bit last year when LaMelo Ball got hurt. And when Malik Monk was even hurt at times too, he was kind of that secondary point guard behind Devontae Graham. So, you know, he can handle the ball. He said his natural position is point guard, but I think he's better on his catch and shoot situations rather than trying to create his own shot off the drive. So one of the new faces here in Charlotte is Kelly Oubre Jr., uh, who you guys signed in free agency. Um, What do you think his optimal role is? Because right now I'm looking at this depth chart. He is currently on your second unit. If he's someone who's potentially coming off your bench, that is an absolutely unbelievable addition here. Yeah, I mean, I think I look at Kelly Oubre as kind of like an insurance policy with Gordon Hayward. Good I mean, point. because of the way that his health has been the last couple of years. And one of the things that James Brago has talked about a couple of times already in preseason is talking about getting Gordon Hayward on some sort of load management program. I mean, he's obviously it's really hard to play all 82 games in this league. I think one of the things that you might see this year, though, is picking some spots in the schedule to get Gordon some rest when it's allowed. I mean, obviously there's been a lot of talk the last couple of years in the NBA about, you know, sitting players, resting players, San Antonio was always involved in those kind of situations. And, you know, there's obviously fines and, and other things involved there, but, you know, for the most part, Gordon will probably be on some sort of, I don't want to call it a minutes restriction. It might be a game restriction. I don't know if there's like a target number. It's just kind of how the season is going to go for the most part, but you know, expect Kelly Oubre to have a big impact. He's not going to start every game. He's going to be one of those guys that comes off the bench. And I'm really excited. I mean, when I first saw Kelly Oubre get signed, I was, I had some mixed reactions because I just remember seeing him here last year playing for Golden State. He'll hit a three and a corner. He'll turn around. If it's in front of the Hornets bench, he would blow kisses to the bench. He just, it's just that kind of swagger that Kelly plays with. And that's just the kind of person he is. So he's one of those guys where you don't want to play against him. You just despise him. For the most part, but you're he's one of those guys that you just absolutely love to have on your team because you know he is very down to earth when you hear when you're talking to him. You always hear him talking about tsunami poppy, and that's kind of his alter ego and all that stuff. And you know, he rides the wave and it's just you know, everything is everything's good, everything's chill. So it's just kind of the swagger that he plays with. Um, again, one of those guys that you hate to play against but love to have on your team. And he's been a really great teammate, it seems like, from some of the other guys. I mean. He's gelled. He says it's always a blessing to play in the city. You know, he's he's yeah. one of those guys that's, you know, new to the fold. But, you know, you ask him, you know, how is this? How is that? He says it's a blessing. So, you know, he's taken it in stride. He was one of those guys that might have had some limited opportunities in free agency last year just because mm-hmm. of this he had with Golden State. But to be honest, I don't think Kelly got a fair shake in Golden State because, you know, it's it's tough to fill some shoes with a guy like Clay Thompson. And that's what he yeah. was asked to do. And you cannot replace a guy like Clay Thompson. I don't care who you are. Uh, so it's just really tough situation for him to be in. So I think now that he's in Charlotte, there's not a lot of pressure on him to be a replacement for Clay Thompson. It's kind of like a, Hey, we're going to bring you off the bench. We're going to give you the minutes you deserve. You're going to go out and you're going to play well. 
you know, if you need to step in for a guy like Gordon Hayward at the three, you know, even if you need to go play a little bit of the two, I mean, he can kind of hybrid. He's, he's kind of a hybrid. He can kind of go from that three spot in a small forward. He can also play a little bit of shooting guard as well, if he's needed. So, you know, there's definitely some opportunities for him to kind of slot in wherever he needs, but he is definitely going to be one of those guys that's going to really, really, really elevate to play the bench because that was a problem last year for the Hornets. Once that second unit came in, they were not able to score the basketball very well. With a guy like Kelly Oubre, he brings a lot of defense, but he can bring a lot of offense as well. Hey, you talk about that bench. You also look at the four position. You have Miles Bridges and P.J. Washington both returning. One of them will likely come off the bench. So it looks like you guys have some options deep in your rotation this year that should help your team uh, moving forward. One other guy you guys added, you already mentioned his name, uh, Mason Plumley. Talk about that addition and how you see him fitting in his first season. So it was kind of one that came out of nowhere. I mean, a lot of people knew that the five was going to be an emphasis this year for the Hornets. A lot of people thought it was going to come in free agency. I mean, there were a lot of viable names out there. One of them that I really liked was Nerland's Noel. Obviously, Mm -hmm. he re-upped with the Knicks. But, you know, the Mason Plumlee deal kind of came out of nowhere. It was one of those draft things where I think the, the Pistons, you know, obviously with Cade Cunningham, yeah, they got the number one overall pick. They were in a position where they're trying to just kind of rebuild. I mean, they're trying to retool in the roster because, you know, when Mason got there a couple of years ago in Detroit, they were kind of in win now mode. I mean, they still had Blake Griffin. They still had some, and Derek Rose too. They still had some decent pieces there. So, you know, when things weren't working out, they decided they wanted to kind of implode the team. And I think they wanted to offset that salary to somebody else. It's not really a ton of money either. I think Mason's salary is only around 8 million or so. So he's yeah. a relatively cheap option. And the Hornets were kind of the beneficiaries because the other thing that a lot of people didn't notice in that trade was not only did the Hornets get Mason Plumlee, they also moved up in the second round. They moved up, I I want to say about 18 picks to pick up JT Thor out of Auburn, who is an also, he's kind of an under the radar guy. I mean, he only just turned 18, I think two weeks ago or something like that. I mean, he was, he's still very young. He's still very raw. And he's one of those guys that you kind of stash in the second round. You, you make him go to the G League for a year or two, see what he's got, see if he can get some muscle. Uh, one of the things that Mitch Kupchak always talks about when he talks about power forwards and centers, guys at the bigs position in the front court, he always talks about how the younger the guys are, the more raw they are. He said that the center position is the hardest position to learn in basketball just because there takes so much maturity to kind of develop and play against these, these grown men that are, you know, seven feet tall and 300 pounds that can move like the wind. I mean, it's just kind of the nature of how the NBA is. And now, especially when you got some of these, these bigs out there, like a Joel Embiid who can sit out on the three point line and, and shoot threes if he wants. I mean, it just makes them almost unguardable. And then you got the guys that are rim protectors like Rudy Gobert. So, you know, the thing that the Hornets really like about Mason Plumlee, is the fact that he is able to play the pick and roll position so well. He is able to screen and roll to the basket extremely well. And that's something that LaMelo Ball is really going to love. I mean, we've seen it a couple times in the preseason, but the unfortunately the thing with with Mason was he didn't have as much time to kind of develop in the preseason just because he was out with health and safety protocols. So they only got he only got to play two preseason games. He played the first one against Oklahoma City where the team looked extremely good albeit it is Oklahoma city after all. So, I mean, they're playing for first round picks in 2030 at this point with the way that they have all of these, these picks stashed. I mean, they're probably out. They're probably out there right now scouting middle school kids at this point. I mean, that's just (laughs) how far in advance that they are, but I mean, at any rate, um, you know, Mason played the last preseason game against Dallas, which a lot of us here in Charlotte are just trying to forget because it was just not good by any means. So, you know, he's trying to get his breath underneath him a little bit as well. Uh, moving forward because coming off the health and safety protocols and that kind of stuff being in isolation. I mean, there's not much you can do other than push ups and sit ups and that kind of stuff. So, you know, he's trying to get his wind underneath him. He is a little bit of a more veteran player, Uh, but he's going to be one that a lot of people are looking to fill that five spot. He is the definitive starter. And then everybody else just kind of falls in line. You talked about the depth with PJ Washington and miles bridges, you know, PJ played a lot of stretch five last year. He played a lot of small ball five. He's probably going to see that role again this year a lot. I mean, there's kind of a logjam at the center position behind Mason Plumlee just because you guys got, like, Vernon Carey. Kai Jones was a first-round pick as well. The Hornets moved up to pick him. He's playing both the four and the five. So, you know, he's just another one of those hybrid guys as well. There's just so much going on in the front court that Mason Plumlee is the the leader in the clubhouse right now, and everybody's just – 
kind of trying to play catch up in terms of minutes and availability really uh, moving forward. When you talk about young raw big man, I want to revisit a name you just mentioned. Give me your take on Kai Jones. Cause I like that pick you guys made. Kai Jones can jump out of the building. He yeah. is so he is so athletic. And the thing that people don't realize about Kai is, well, one, he's just a great person. I mean, he's always smiling. He always has this upbeat personality. You know, he, one of the things in his introductory press conference that he kept referencing was it's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to be here. I'm so happy to be here because he didn't have the traditional path to basketball that a lot of people do. When he was about 15 or 16, he was in the Bahamas and he was a track star. He would do all of the field events. He was doing long jump, high jump. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize this. So he is very raw. I mean, he, when he went to Texas, he only had, I mean, maybe one or two years of formal basketball under his belt. I mean, a lot of it was just pickup and that sort of stuff. And he ended up going to Texas. He didn't really get a fair shake, I don't think. He was kind of in a backup role there. But his athleticism got him into the first round. And a lot of people a lot of people didn't expect James Booknight to be there at number 11 for the Hornets. A lot, of people, a lot of people did not expect him to be there. A lot of people expected him to be in the top 10. When he fell, it was kind of like, you know, Mish Kupchak's philosophy is always best player available no matter what. And that's what happened in the 2020 draft with LaMelo Ball. I mean, obviously, you know, the way that the roster was at the time, they had Malik Monk, Devontae Graham, and they didn't really need a guy like LaMelo Ball. But when he falls to you at that number three position, because guys like the Warriors passed on him because they, again, you know, the Warriors couldn't really take LaMelo Ball because he's not going to replace Steph Curry. But, yeah. I mean, but when you go back and you think about it, you're like, could you just imagine – if the Warriors ended up taking LaMelo Ball, so then they would have had LaMelo and Steph on the same team. I mean, that would just would have been bonkers. So, I mean, again, thank you, Golden State, for gifting LaMelo Ball to the Hornets. <laughs> Andrew Wiggins is a great pick, don't get me wrong, but I would rather have, you know, the rookie of the year over Andrew Wiggins. But anyways, to get back to Kai Jones, you know, he's one of those guys that's going to have to take some time to develop. And it was a great move by Mitch Kupchak jumping back into the first round after already getting a guy like Book Knight at the number 11 spot You take a pick away from the Knicks that is heavily protected. I think the Hornets have to finish like top four in the East this season for that pick to even be conveyed. So like, I mean, it's, it's a heavily protected pick. You didn't really give up a whole lot. I, I I look in New York and I was like, are you, are you sure you guys want to make this trade? I mean, we'll take it, but um, it was just a little bit of weird trade from New York standpoint. I guess they didn't like anybody at that 19 spot and they figured we could stash this for next year to see if there's somebody else that we really like, but yeah, the Kai Jones pick is is a really good one, I think. It's just a matter of getting him developed. I mean, we saw a lot of flashes of his athleticism in Summer League. There was a play in Summer League where, like, he took off from, like, the inner part of the arc in the paint, and, like, he just reached and was able to dunk the ball. I mean, it was just like this – it was just this crazy dunk. Like, it was just, like, effortless. Um, so the running joke always is right now is who's going to win in a dunk contest? Is it going to be Kai Jones or is it going to be – uh, Miles Bridges, and uh, it's I like love it, to see that. It, well, apparently there was one that happened a couple of weeks ago in camp, and James Booknight even got involved too. And Kai referenced it. He said, "You know what?" He goes, "He goes." James has a, he called it sneaky bounce, and and okay. Booknight, Booknight's got some hops. I've seen him take off a couple of times as well, and I we might see him a couple of times. You know, catch a couple of people here in the uh, in the regular season. We asked him about that. After one media availability the one day, he said, you know, what do you think about that? Are you is your bounce slept on? He goes, I want it to be slept on because I'm gonna catch somebody slipping one time. So, you know, both sides, he's ready to go too. But Kai Jones, he is gonna be one of those guys. Give him a year or two, and he's going to be a force, especially if he really learns how to play that center position in the NBA, because it is a physical position. And, you know, obviously Kai's a little bit wiry, so he needs a little bit of meat on the bones, but look for Kai Jones in a year or two. So give me your expectations for the Charlotte Hornets in 2021-2022. Well, it's funny you ask because we had this uh, podcast a couple weeks ago with Sam Farber and Sam Hurley, who is a writer at Hornets.com, and we did a, you know, what is your expectation? What is your win total? So I have it sitting here in the studio. I have it written down down win by game by game. So I have the Hornets. I think they're going to surprise some people this year. I got the Hornets at 45 and 37 this year. I got okay. them. I got them at a winning record this year. We'll see what happens. I have them at thirty-four and twenty-six at the All Star break. The way that the schedule works okay. out for the Hornets is really interesting because they have both of their 
um, road trips to the West Coast in the first half of the season. They're done going to the West Coast by December, by Christmas. So they're getting all of their West Coast games out of the out of the way. Obviously, the Western Conference isn't quite what it was, you know, a couple of years ago. I think the Eastern Conference has kind of balanced that out a little bit just in terms of, you know, really competitive teams. But it's still, it sucks to go all the way across the country. You're away from your family. You're sitting in a hotel room. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different this year because the Hornets by – the Hornets are supposed to be, according to James Brago, 100% vaccinated by the beginning of the season. Obviously, that would be today. So we're going to go ahead and assume that they are 100% fully vaccinated. So the restrictions on them are – you know, there's not many restrictions when they go on a road. I mean, obviously, last year was different. Nice. You know, you're taking – you're taking two different buses. You're getting your own hotel rooms. You know, everybody's spread out. You can't eat meals together. All that's different now. You can go out. You can enjoy a meal. You can you can bond with your teammates now. And a lot of that got lost last year. And that's something that James Brago has mentioned time and time again about building that camaraderie. I mean, there was, this, there was an instance a couple weeks ago before training camp where JB had the entire team over to his house for dinner. And they're just building nice. that kind of that camaraderie and that team chemistry. And there was a really big – event that happened over the summer where Terry Rozier, he signed that contract extension. He got the entire team down to Miami to train together for a couple of days, um, which is kind of unheard of. I mean, like I know that there was a big uh, mention of it in the national media when it happened, LeBron James did like a two day mini camp with his players with the Lakers. And I think like Las Vegas, and it was like this big, huge deal. Terry Rozier got him done before that. So I like to say that Terry (laughs) kind of, you know, LeBron is mimicking Terry and doing that, that uh, preseason training, I guess, that's kind of like a OTA, I guess, if you had to put it into a football term, even though it's not organized through the NBA. But uh, in terms of expectations, I think that chemistry is going to help. I think that camaraderie is going to help when they go on the road. Uh, I got them at 45 and 37 this year. I think they're going to surprise a couple teams. They're going to catch a couple teams. A lot of that, though, obviously, is going to be if they can stay healthy. So, I mean, that's obviously a big question mark. I don't know where that puts them position-wise in the East. I mean, the East is going to be tough this year with teams like Milwaukee. Even without Kyrie, the Nets are still going to be the perennial favorite. A lot of people are really high on the Hawks, which I think are going to be really solid with Nate McMillan having a full season at head coach. I'm not entirely sold on the heat. I know a lot of people are. I just don't know how that's going to work, especially with Chicago too. Chicago, I think are, you know, I don't want to call them paper tigers right now, but I just don't know how some of those guys like LaMarcus Aldridge is just going to kind of fit in with that system that they have there. Um, You know, they're really big up front, which is going to be interesting. And it's going to pose a lot of problems for the Hornets, but you know, in general, I just don't know how those guys are going to mesh well, but, you know, that's why we play the games. Yeah. All right, Rob, before I let you go, man, how can our listeners here keep in touch with you on social media and listen to you when uh, you're uh, you're talking Hornets? Yeah, for sure. So, obviously, you can give me a follow on Twitter at Rob underscore Longo. Uh, in terms of, you know, some stuff, you want some daily podcast action, we have the Hornets Hivecast, which is a daily podcast. Really big guests on it this past week. Uh, Mitch Kupchak was on there Monday talking with Sam Farber about you know, just kind of how the the offseason shook out, his expectations for the team. Head coach James Brego was on there yesterday as well on Tuesday, um, you know, kind of going over his expectations and, you know, what he learned during this pandemic season as well. So some really good guests. We'll be at it every day. We might take a day or two off during the All-Star break in February. So don't hold us to every single day. But, you know, when we when we're on when we're on a roll during the season, we will be on our Hornets Hivecast. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes. Apple Music, Spotify, we are on them all. Um, and then when we're on the road, I will be in the captain's chair hosting the podcast. So um, if you uh, if you needed some more incentive to listen to it, you got it right there. But, you know, Sam Farber does a great job as well. We'll always get some guests, some guys covering the Hornets. I think uh, tomorrow we'll have somebody from The Athletic on. So it's just uh, it's just one of those things where we're, we're cranking out content every single day, and it's something that you can check out. Awesome. I'll be checking it out, Rob. I will. You, I, you, you know, one of those views will be me every time, man. Cool. I appreciate it. Man. Hey, Thank you very much. We appreciate the support. Hell yeah, man. Well, I appreciate the support from you on this show. Thank you very much for joining me again on the Alec Welch show. Yeah, thanks for having me anytime. All right, well, that's going to be it for this episode of the Alec Welch Show. I'm Alec Walt alongside Rob Longo. What do you think of the Charlotte Hornets? Where do you think they'll place in the Eastern Conference? Feel free to comment that below. Also, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Down the Block Sports for more of my exclusive content. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you very soon.